there are many lessons in life that you don't want to learn too late. And today I'm going to share 36 brutal truths that I wish I knew when I was 20 years old. And the first one is no one is coming to save you. For the longest time in my life, I wanted somebody to save me. I wanted my parents to save me. I wanted my friends to save me. I wanted drugs to save me. I wanted girls to save me. And what I realized is the only person that could change my life was myself. And I had to focus on that first. Number two, you're not that important. I constantly was worried about what other people thought of me throughout the younger years of my life and even into my early and mid 20s. And what I quickly realized is that people have their own thing going on. They have their own problems. They have their own things they're trying to manage that nobody cares about you as much as you think they do. So stop worrying about what other people think and just focus on yourself. Number three, respect yourself and others will follow. If you're somebody who's trying to fit in with other people, you have no boundaries, you don't stand up for yourself, people are not going to respect you. They're going to take advantage of you. They're going to walk all over you. And that's going to be a pattern that will cost you later in life. My own personal experience when I was a kid, I had no boundaries. I let people say whatever they wanted to me. I let people walk all over me. And that led to me becoming massively insecure, super low self-esteem, no positive outlook on life. And when I started to respect myself, have boundaries, stay disciplined, stand up for myself, not only did my self-esteem, my self-confidence change, but the way that other people treated me changed as well. Number four, avoid the happiness trap. There's this big trap that exists that says, when I get this, I'll be happy. And for me, that was, when I get this type of body, I'll be happy. When I have this girl that's interested in me, I'll be happy. When I have this amount of money, I'll be happy. When I get this amount of success, I'll be happy. And what I learned every single time is as soon as I got that thing, I wasn't fully happy. Happiness is an inside job and you have to focus on doing things for the right reasons so that you can avoid falling into that trap. Number five, protect your energy at all costs. This includes the people you spend time with. This includes the places you go to. This includes your behaviors, your habits, what you do on a daily basis, what you watch, what you listen to, what you read. This includes everything. I know for me, I didn't protect my energy at all when I was younger. I allowed whoever into my life. I didn't care about what my relationships looked like. I didn't care about my life. I didn't care about my habits. And then what ended up happening was my life started to fall apart. I got addicted to drugs, started selling drugs, and eventually was incarcerated, which fortunately changed my life. But be aware of your energy. Protect it at all costs. Be mindful of who you're spending time with. Be mindful of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Number six, nobody knows what they're doing. One of the things that I struggled with before I started anything meaningful was I don't have everything figured out right now. Like, what am I going to do? And the more people I've come across in my industry and other industries I've learned is that nobody really has it figured out. They're learning along the way. They're growing along the way. They're learning lessons along the way. Nobody has it figured out from the beginning. So I encourage you to just start doing the thing, whatever it is, and just understand that the only way to figure it out is to move forward with that task. Number seven, small wins matter. I think a lot of times in life, we're looking for that big home run. We're looking for that big health transformation. We're looking for that big raise in my industry, like a big number of downloads or whatever the case is. But the reality is what matters and what leads to those big wins is the small wins. It's the daily things. It's the hourly things. It's the weekly things. And it's learning how to stay consistent with those so they can stack up over time. I'm telling you, every single person that I know that has achieved anything meaningful, it came from their ability to be disciplined, consistent, and learn how to stack small wins. Number eight, your inner circle matters more than you think. I think Jim Rohn said you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And it's true. Like your environment creates a false sense of normalcy. I've talked about this before. Where if the five people in your life that you spend the most time with are pessimistic, they're gossiping about each other, they're doing a bunch of drugs, they're partying, you will slowly become like those people. So you have to be very, very protective of that. Whereas on the other hand, if you're somebody that is surrounding yourself with five people that are focused on improving their health and wellness, they're focused on being positive when things are tough, they're focusing on contributing to the world in a meaningful way, you will become like those people. So I'm telling you, your inner circle matters more than you think. Number nine, the easy road will cost you. Life's tough. Life is hard. Life is challenging. If you get used to cheating and taking the easy way out and taking shortcuts, 
that will compound throughout the course of your life. And that will end up developing a new normal for you and how you deal with things. And you won't know how to deal with life when it gets hard because you're so used to taking the easy way out. So I encourage you to just do the hard things. Stay consistent with whatever it is that's challenging for you. Don't cheat. Don't take shortcuts. You deserve more than that. Number 10, the fastest way to lose yourself is to spend time with people you're not aligned with. I've said this before. You will feel way more alone spending time with people in your life that are not meant to be around you than you ever will spending time by yourself in an intentional way. Because what happens is you start to lose your sense of self. We all have this identity within us of who we are, what we like, our goals, our own meanings and desires, et cetera. And the moment we start spending time with people that are not aligned with those, that they don't, we don't have common interests and common values, again, we start to shift like those people and we end up losing ourselves. We end up looking back six months down the road, a year down the road, two years down the road, and we're miserable and we don't know why. And I think the main reason is because you've morphed into somebody you don't like because you were trying to fit in. You were trying to just get validation or attention in whatever way possible. So be very intentional about who you're spending time with for that reason. The fastest way, in my opinion, to lose yourself is to spend time with people that are not meant to be in your life. Number 11, take care of your body at all costs. I know for me, when I was younger, I thought I was invincible. I thought I could do all these drugs. I thought I could eat however I wanted. I thought I could not move my body and I would be great. I didn't overdose. Fortunately, I didn't die. But there's plenty of people, obviously, that unfortunately did lose their life to drug overdoses. And unfortunately, there's a lot of other people whose health choices in their younger years catch up with them in their 20s, 30s, 40s, etc. So take care of your body at all costs. I don't know the exact quote. I don't know who said it, but it's something like we all have these wishes in our life. We all have these dreams. And when our health goes to crap, the only dream and wish we have is we want our health back. So I think it's really important to do whatever you can to take care of your body in whatever way that looks like for you. You don't have to be a bodybuilder. You don't have to be somebody who's going to the gym five, six days a week. Find something that works for you to move your body on a consistent basis. Number 12, focus on the solution and not the problem. When problems arise, it's so easy to get laser focused on the problem and ruminate and future trip and say, oh my gosh, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And you end up wasting so much time that you could be spending on the solution. In my experience, what's worked for me when something happens is to develop the awareness around the problem, whatever it is, and then to say, okay, like what can I control in the situation? Write those things down or think about those things. What can I control? And then figure out like what are some things I could do in this moment to improve that problem or fix the problem and go from there. And that could be a variety of things. My point is you want to spend as little time focusing on the problem as possible and spend a majority of time on the solution. Because when you spend time focusing on the problem, it's easy to slip and fall into that victim mindset and start blaming everybody else for your problems instead of taking responsibility for what you can do about that single problem and move you towards a solution, which is what we all want anyway. Number 13, Have a few ride or die friends. This is really, really important. You have to have those people in your life that you trust with anything, that you know that if you call them at two o'clock in the morning, that they will come and help you if your car is broken down. You know that if somebody close to you dies, you're going through something really, really traumatic, you can call them and they will either pick up the phone or they will come over and see you right away. They're the person that you make a really bad mistake and you need to fess up to somebody to talk about and process that you call them. There's somebody that just shows up for you no matter what. We need those people in our lives and really focus on that. And the way to get those people into your life is to pour into that relationship as well. Like relationships are like plants. You got to water them in order for them to grow. So those people in your life that you know in your gut are just solid people, good friends, keep them close and do whatever it takes to build that relationship and nourish it. Number 14, you don't have to be liked by everyone and you don't have to like everyone. As somebody who is a recovering people pleaser, I used to do whatever I could to fit in with every crowd when I was younger. I wanted everyone to like me because I felt that if people didn't like me, no matter who they were, it was a representation of who I was as a person. And what that ended up getting me was the problems that I talked about before. And I ended up just not liking myself because I had no identity for who I was as a person because I was constantly trying to fit into these different boxes of different friend groups in order to avoid being disliked. I also was very passive 
in my opinions of other people and in, in my discernment of other people because I was afraid of saying, I really don't like that person. Or, that person just rubs me the wrong way. And it's not to say that you have to be rude and disrespectful, but I think it's important to understand that there's going to be certain people in your life that you just don't jive with. There's going to be certain people in your life that just don't jive with you, and that's okay. It's not a representation of who you are as a person. It's more of just a representation of just human nature. So I encourage you to remember that because the moment you try to be liked by everybody else is the moment you're going to begin not to be liked by yourself. Number 15, being polite goes a long way. This could be holding the door open for somebody. This could be tipping somebody a little bit more at a restaurant. This could just be saying please and thank you or sending a text out to somebody you care about and saying you appreciate them, whatever it is. Being polite goes a long way. When I was younger, I thought being polite was like uncool or unpopular. Or like I just had this chip on my shoulder and I was just kind of hard shelled on the outside. And I was like, you know what? Like being polite is a sign of weakness. And the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that being polite is a sign of maturity. It's a sign of emotional intelligence. It's a sign of just somebody that really values themselves and values other people. So be polite wherever you can. doesn't matter who the person is. Just make sure that you're handling every situation in a way where you're treating others in the same way you expect to be treated. Along those same lines, number 16, you can tell a lot about somebody by how they treat people in the service industry. We talked about relationships on the podcast. We talked about red flags. And I would say one of the biggest red flags is if somebody is poor to wait staff when you're out with them at a meal. You can tell a lot about a person by how they treat people in the service industry. So be mindful of that. Are you somebody that gets super irritated with the wait staff super easy and almost talks to them in a demanding or demeaning way? Are you, or are you somebody that's like very appreciative of the way they do their job? And you also understand like working in a restaurant is very, very tough and challenging. And in many cases, what's going wrong with your experience isn't their fault anyway. So just being able to have an objective outlook on that situation, I think will go a long way um, because I think you are, because the reality is you are being judged by the person you're out with, by how you treat the wait staff. I'm telling you right now, it's one of the biggest red flags to look out for. Number 17, I think at this point it goes without saying, but it's an important reminder. Don't compare yourself to other people, like run your own race. Like the moment you try to compare yourself to other people, you lose. Don't focus on what your neighbor's doing. Don't focus on what um, your best friend's doing with their life. Don't focus on what people online are doing with their life. Focus on you and learn how to run your own race. Do what's best for you. Don't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 20, as they say. Don't compare where you are right now compared to where somebody is who's 10 years older. You can focus on you because the moment you fall into the comparison trap, I'm telling you, you lose. Number 18, learn how to bet on yourself. It's really important to develop this innate belief in your ability to accomplish hard things and to take the chance. When I was younger, I was scared of betting on myself. I was scared of standing up for myself. I was scared at times of asking somebody out that I really liked. I was scared of pursuing the thing that I wanted because I thought that I was a loser. I thought that there was no value for me in whatever I was doing. I thought that I wasn't going to succeed. And it all came from a place of low self-worth and low self-confidence. And so I believe one of the fastest ways, one of the quickest ways to improve your self-confidence is to do things that challenge you. It's to face your fears. Because let's face it, would you rather be rejected by somebody else or rejected by yourself, but knowing that if you got rejected, because let's face it, if you take that chance and let's just say you ask the person out, and they reject you, I guarantee you, you're going to feel a lot better about yourself because you believed in yourself enough to ask that person out versus not doing it and then living with regret because you rejected yourself because you didn't have the ability to believe in yourself to do the thing, right? And that can go on. And that example can be used with a variety of things. So my point here is learn how to bet on yourself. If there's something you want in life, go after it. Face your fears. Do the thing. It will pay off in the end. Number 19, learn how to cultivate self-awareness in whatever way that looks like for you. That means going to therapy. It could be journaling. It could be just being more mindful in the moment on how you're behaving. Whatever the example is, you have to somehow be aware of how your patterns, behaviors, and choices are impacting your life because that's the only way to learn and grow. Because if you're somebody who walks through life with no vision, not able to see what you're doing, you will falter in life because you're going to end up making mistakes or you'll end up saying things to people or you'll end up behaving in a certain way and you just won't see your role in any of it. You won't see that you're the problem in some of this stuff. You won't understand 
how your behavior and the way you act is impacting you. And you'll never get better in life. So you have to find a way to become aware of how you're acting on a daily basis in whatever way works for you. Number 20, things will come and go. I get it. Material things can certainly have value and have some importance in your life, but those things will come and go. And those things can be replaced if they're broken or you lose them. What really matters is the non-material things, your health, relationships, how you treat other people, your impact on the world, how you feel about yourself, your mental health, your family, your friends, like those things are what actually matter. So while it's easy to get caught up in the material things, the houses, the cars, the watches, et cetera, I think you need to take a step back and say, okay, like where am I really putting my energy and focus and put it on the things that if you lose, it may cost you. It may cost you happiness. It may cost you your mental health. It may cost you some meaning and purpose in the world. Number 21, wherever you go, there you are. You can't outrun your problems. So many times we think that moving out of state or changing jobs or changing relationships or buying a new car or changing a therapist or whatever the example is, is going to make our life better because we're so focused on the other thing, the other person being the problem that we don't realize that the common denominator in all of our problems tends to be us. So with that said, I encourage you to really, again, it comes back to self-awareness on your patterns and behaviors. That's why I emphasized that before, because this is important, but also making sure that you're doing things for the right reasons. Are you moving out of state because you genuinely want to leave the state you're in? Are you moving because you're running away from your problems? Are you changing therapists because they genuinely aren't helping you? Or are you changing therapists because they're telling you what you don't want to hear and you don't want to have to look in the mirror? Are you changing a relationship because it's really that bad for you? Are you changing the relationship because they show a side of you that needs to be worked on and you don't know how to take, take responsibility for that part of yourself, right? So remember, wherever you go, there you are. You can't outrun your problems. Number 22, self-pity and self-compassion are not the same. Self-compassion is having compassion for yourself for what you're going through. It's holding yourself accountable to do the thing you need to do to get better during hard times. It's understanding that we all make mistakes in life and things are okay. It's understanding that sometimes we say things to other people that we don't mean and we can have forgiveness around all of that. That's self-compassion. Self-pity is feeling sorry for yourself and saying, I can't believe the world's against me. I can't believe I always get the short end of the stick. I can't believe my life is so hard. I can't believe my life, my life is so negative. And self-pity will leave you feeling depleted and feeling weak and feeling like lack of control and disempowered, whereas self-compassion will leave you feeling empowered and it will lead to personal growth. So there's a big difference between self-pity and self-compassion. Self-pity leads to disempowerment, leaves you feeling out of control, it leaves you feeling weak, whereas self-compassion leaves you feeling loved and it leaves you feeling like you've got this. It leaves you feeling like there's going to be some growth that comes from the situation. If you're like me and are constantly on the go juggling work, social outings, and all the other chaos life throws your way, I have found an absolute game changer that gives me some time back. Jimmy's Famous Meals is a local meal prep company that provides fully cooked, chef-prepared meals and can deliver them right to your doorstep. I am currently about to eat the Greek lemon chicken, which is one of my favorites. I get this every week, and I absolutely love Jimmy's Famous Meals. They are so good and delicious. Picture this. No more stressing over what to cook after a long day and always having a wholesome, delicious meal waiting for you in your fridge. Their meals are prepped, cooked, and ready to heat and eat in minutes. So say goodbye to the hassle of grocery shopping and meal planning. With Jimmy's Famous Meals, convenience is served straight to your doorstep. So if you're looking to get your time back and make healthy eating easy, head to jimmysfamousmeals.com. And when you use the promo code DOUG25 at checkout, you'll get 25% off your order. Cheers to healthy eating. Number 23, learn how to cook. I think it's one of the greatest skills you can learn just because of the creativity that comes from it, the self-sufficiency that you learn the amount of money you'll save by not having to go out to eat every day. Obviously, there's so many benefits for your overall health and wellness. But also, if you're somebody who's focused on relationships, I think one of the best things you can do in a relationship is cook a nice meal together and just relax and chill out at home. I mean, I think it's something that I know people just really enjoy. They love when somebody cooks a nice meal for them. And it's something that I think you can do as a couple to get creative 
with some of the activities that you do for fun. It's just a great skill to learn. Trust me, because like one of the biggest things I've heard people feel ashamed of is when they don't know how to cook something because they feel kind of powerless, helpless, and they feel like they have to always rely on somebody for survival in a way. So I think if you can learn how to cook on your own and just develop those skills, there's plenty of resources at this point to teach you how to do so. I think you will feel a lot better about yourself. Number 24, do whatever it takes. Like in life, it's going to be challenging sometimes. Goals are hard to reach. Changing your life is hard to do. Improving a relationship is challenging. Sticking to things you say you're going to do is tough. Like managing stress, all these things are tough. But what's also tough is living with regret years later because you gave up on yourself. And you look back and you're like, I wish I would have done whatever it took to manage my stress. I wish I would have done whatever it took to take that next step in my career to advance myself. I wish I would have taken whatever it took to save that relationship because I really, really valued that person. Whatever the example is, like do whatever it takes. Trust me, you will thank yourself in the end. Number 25, sometimes you got to play hurt. Like in life, you're not always going to feel 100%, but you have to show up with your 100%. I'm telling you, you're not always going to have the perfect sleep. Your stress levels are going to vary. Your mood is going to fluctuate depending on what you have going on in your life. There's going to be things that come up naturally that impact the way you feel about yourself. And that's not really what counts. What counts is how are you showing up for yourself when times are tough? It's easy to do the things when life is perfect, when things are flowing, when money's good, when relationships are good, when your sleep's great, when your stress is managed. It's easy to show up then. But what really counts is when you're a little hurt, when you only got like five or six hours of sleep, when you got into a fight with your partner, when you've had some stress come up in your life, when you're feeling a little bit anxious, that's when it counts. That's when these, a lot of these self-help tools that people talk about, that's when they count. It's like, how are you showing up for yourself when you're hurt? Because what happens is if you, if you tell yourself you're not going to show up for yourself when you're hurt, you're teaching yourself that when life gets hard, I don't show up for myself. And that's a really, really slippery slope to be on because as I've said, life is tough and it's how you deal with it that counts. Number 26, your failures don't define you. When I was growing up, I made a lot of mistakes, tons of mistakes, as people know from my story. And I thought that those failures defined me as a person. I thought I was going to be a loser for the rest of my life. I thought I was going to be a screw up for the rest of my life. I thought I was going to be a failure for the rest of my life. And one of the biggest mindset shifts that I've made is that once I learned that I just screwed up and I'm not a screw up, I began to change the, the narrative around my story and my perspective changed permanently. So now I see failures in times where I mess up as opportunities for growth and perspective and being able to like look at my actions and my behaviors and figuring out like what went wrong, what I could have done better and how I can get better moving forward. So again, your failures don't define you. Number 27, don't chase perfection. Perfection doesn't exist. You're never going to be perfect. And I think once you accept that, you start to take action on certain things. You start to take action on the workout routine. You start to take action on writing that book. You start to take action on dating. You start to take action on bettering yourself, whatever the example is, because we're always waiting for like this perfect opportunity to start something. And the reality is it's never a perfect opportunity. As I talked about earlier, nobody knows what they're doing. We're all just trying to figure it out along the way. So once you understand that perfection doesn't exist and you can just focus on just getting a little bit better each and every day, things will change because you're not going to chase after this false narrative or image of yourself or your life that you think exists. You're going to instead focus on the reality of the situation and what that is and just learning how to get better incrementally day in and day out. Number 28, forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is a powerful thing for a variety of reasons. The first reason is because you can't change the situation or the circumstance that happened that you are holding on to resentment for. What you can change is your view of the situation. And learning as tough as it is, just say, you know what, as hard and as challenging as whatever fill in the blank happened to me or happened in my life, I need to let this go for myself so that I can stop letting that person or that situation win. I need to let that go so that I can release that and I can move forward in my life. And the same thing happens with forgiveness for yourself. And I think forgiving yourself in many times is way harder than forgiving other people because we're so self-conscious and we're so hard on ourselves. 
that it takes a lot more effort at times to say, you know what? Like, I forgive you. I forgive you for wrecking your life for two years. I forgive you for the way you behaved in that relationship. I forgive you for the way you treated yourself. I forgive you for quitting that job when you shouldn't have. Whatever the example is, I forgive you. It's a tough thing to do. And one of the things that I think can be helpful is writing a forgiveness letter. Like just writing out all the things that I forgave myself for was really, really powerful because it allowed me to process a lot of this pain that I was holding on to regarding my, my life and my behavior and putting it out into the world and just taking it out of my mind and onto something else. So forgiveness is a powerful tool and it's for you. It's not for somebody else. Number 29, you don't have to win every argument. We've all been there. We have to get the last word in with every argument. And there's an old saying, I don't know who says it, but it's like, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And I think it's an important concept to remember because the point of having an argument isn't to win or lose. It's to like, hopefully, depending on who it is, it's to grow closer together. Like if you're in a relationship and you get into a disagreement, that means there was somebody that got hurt, disrespected or whatever. And so that's a great opportunity to grow together and be like, oh, like I didn't see that. I don't understand how that impacted you, but now I do, or whatever the case is. And you learn to grow together. The same thing like in a professional world, like if you have a disagreement with a coworker or your boss, like that's an opportunity to learn more about each other and grow closer together in a professional way. But when you try and win and get the last word in, the only thing that loses is you and, their, and your relationships. Trust me, I've been there where I send the text to try to get the last word in and then it goes silent or I'm on the phone saying something that, to get the last word in where I'm rude. And I feel like crap about it because I'm like, man, why did I say that? Like, why did I stoop to that level to try to win the argument? Because the only person it hurt was myself. Number 30, learn how to self-regulate. This is an important because if you don't learn how to self-regulate, you will find unhealthy coping mechanisms to do so. You will resort to things like drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, spending a bunch of money you don't have, watching porn, whatever the, the example is, if you can't figure out healthy ways to self-regulate. Like I've said a number of times already on this episode, life's going to suck sometimes. Life is going to be challenging and you have to find ways to calm yourself down in a way that's healthy so that you can develop these habits and these behaviors to be able to utilize them moving forward for when life continues to be more difficult and difficult. Because otherwise, if you don't and you resort to those unhealthy coping mechanisms, your life will get worse really, really quick. Number 31, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. I know me, when I was younger, I had this huge chip on my shoulder and this big ego, like, man, if I ask for help, that's a sign of weakness. Or if I ask for help, nobody's going to want to help me. Or if I ask for help, that means that I'm somehow like less than or whatever. What I got to say is the more I've asked for help as an adult, and the more I've asked for help as I've gotten older, the more my life actually got better because now I was able to, to lean on people that knew more about the situation than I did to help me in whatever situation I was going through. And I didn't feel so alone with the problem I was going through. I felt like I had somebody who was in my corner. I felt like I had some community behind me that could help support me during whatever it was that I was going through. Suffering in silence is a, is a really challenging thing. And I have compassion for people that do because I understand how hard it is to reach out and ask for help. With that said, it's important to let your guard down and reach out for help. That's why I mentioned earlier about having the ride or die friends, because typically when you're going through something, these are the people you want to reach out to and ask for help and say you're going through something. Number 32, learn how to set boundaries, but don't burn bridges. It's important to respect yourself and set boundaries with people that cross them on your end or to be able to stand up for yourself and let people know like, how they should treat you or how you should treat them or whatever the example is, but you don't want to burn a bridge because you never know who may come back to be your boss later in life, who may come back and you might be in a relationship with them. You, they may be some sort of coworker. They may be your neighbor. You never know who that person's going to be in your life. Now, obviously, there's situations where you need to set a permanent boundary. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just generally speaking with the people in your life, like stand up for yourself, set boundaries you know, have a certain standard on how you treat others and how you'd like to be treated, but don't burn bridges with people that violate your boundaries because it could end up costing you in the end. Number 33, life is not fair. And I know that I've kind of hinted at this a few times throughout this episode, but I say this again because life is not fair. 
And the moment you realize that, your perception of what happens in your life changes because you start to overcome and escape the victim mindset. And you're like, oh, like life isn't fair. I understand that this is happening in my life right now. And I understand this is challenging. However, with that said, I know I'm, I can't feel sorry for myself in this moment. I'm going to do whatever I can to make my situation better. As a result of overcoming the things in life that aren't fair, I'm going to end up growing as a person. I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to get wiser. I'm going to make better decisions in my life. The opposite of that is if you feel sorry for yourself and you're constantly telling yourself that life isn't fair and you don't actually accept that as truth, you'll continue to perpetuate problems in your life, feeling sorry for yourself, and, and your life will get worse because you haven't come to the realization that sometimes life's not fair and you still have to move on. You still have to show up for yourself no matter what. So accept the fact that life's not fair. With that said, number 34, optimism during hard times is a must. When life isn't fair, when life throws you a curveball, when life throws you challenges, as cliche as this sounds, the only way to move forward is to remain optimistic and positive. Doesn't mean you have to see the situation in itself as positive. It means that you have to have some level of optimism or positivity about your ability to move forward in that situation, your ability to overcome the hard thing you're going through, your ability to do whatever it is on a daily basis to improve your situation. Because the opposite ends up costing you more time. When you're negative, when you're pessimistic, when you feel like life's not fair and life's against you, you're going to end up validating your excuses for not taking action to make your life better and not focusing on the solution. So make sure you stay optimistic during hard times. And it also involves like the things around you, not just your mindset. Like who are you spending time with? Again, it goes back to the inner circle point I made. Like if you're spending time with people that are pessimistic and they're like, you know, it's okay. Like life's tough. Like you'll fall into that same trap and you'll start to believe the same things they believe. But if you're hanging out with people that have a growth mindset, and they're focused on getting better in life, they're focusing on improving themselves, odds are during hard times, there are going to be people that are cheerleaders, that are supporting you, that are helping you move forward when you're going through hard times. Number 35, confidence isn't built at the top of the mountain. So many people, including myself, think that when you get to the top of the mountain, all this confidence is going to magically appear in your life. I got to tell you, confidence isn't built at the top of the mountain. It's built on the way up when you fall down and you get up and, and continue to believe in yourself, even when the odds are stacked against you. I've been blessed to achieve a lot of amazing things in my life. I will say the thing that built the most confidence was me going from like zero to three when I was in jail. It was me doing that single push up for my knees when I didn't think I could. It was me like being able to run that mile. It was me being able to believe in myself during my time in jail. It was me being able to like stay disciplined. Like those small little wins in jail when the odds were stacked against me, built so much confidence in my life that has become the foundation for everything that I do today. And so confidence isn't built when you get to the top. It's as you move up and you continue to believe in yourself and get back up after you fall. It's continuing to get back up after the breakup. It's continuing to get back up after you lose the job. It's continuing to get back up after the health scare. It's continuing to get back up after you say something that you shouldn't have said to somebody. It's continuing to get back up even when things are hard. That's how true confidence is built. Number 36 is keep your word at all costs. Nobody likes spending time with people who lie, cheat, et cetera. So I'm gonna keep this short because I think it goes without saying, like keep your word. Like keep your word to other people, don't lie, but keep your word to yourself. If you tell yourself you're gonna do something, do it. If you say you're gonna go to the gym, do it. If you say you're gonna call your parent, do it. If you say you're gonna write down something you're grateful for, do it. Because otherwise your mind is gonna convince you that you're a liar and that it can't trust you. It's going to say, well, you've said you're going to go to the gym for the last four days, but you didn't. So like, how am I going to believe that you're going to do it tomorrow? Or you said you were going to respond to that email from that person who was going to hire you for the job, but you haven't in like four days. Like, how do I believe you? And so I think as I started, people look at keeping your word as it relates to other people. And I think it's obviously very important because when you lie to people, now you got to like figure out which story you told who and try to like figure out how you're going to manipulate the story to make it all make sense to them. And then you, you end up getting caught and it doesn't feel good right? And nobody feels good when they're lying to people. So keep your word at all costs, follow through with your intentions and what you say you're going to do. It's incredibly, incredibly important. So those are 36 of the truths. I could have probably named another 20 or 30 or more. Hopefully these inspired you to get better. Hopefully these inspired you to take some action in your life. Hopefully these inspired you 
to uh, maybe stop making certain mistakes. Maybe he's inspired you to say, you know what, like I'm doing really good in life. I'm really glad that I've learned these lessons a lot sooner than other people, right? So I, I really appreciate everybody who checked out this episode. Make sure to reach out if this resonated with you and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're gonna like this video as well. I'll see you there.